So uh, our next session is going to be the institutional owning and custody panel. So we're going we're gonna to have Lucas Nuzzi from uh, Coinmetrics, Via Rutoria from Fidelity Digital Assets, and uh, Ada Kokoshi from uh, State Street. It's going to be moderated by Manny Zivora, who is the head of product, product strategy at SIA and the previous president of uh, uh, MIT Bitcoin Expo. So please join me in welcoming this great team. Thank you, everyone. Um, are we waiting for Ria to join? She's here? Oh, OK. Awesome. Um, so yeah, the previous talk was a good precursor to this panel. In this panel, we're going to dive deeper into institutions, their adoption of the crypto space, what are the challenges they face, and so on and so forth. So uh, before we dive in, as Thomas mentioned, my name is Mansi Vora. I work on Saya, which is a decentralized storage platform. I was the expo director last year, which was exciting, and it's good to come back as a speaker this year. Um, and in my previous role, uh, before I jumped into the crypto space, I worked in various financial institutions, so this panel is pretty apt for me. So with that, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Lucas Nutzi. I uh, started my career in custody um, a long time ago. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil. I started helping um, Brazilian startups that were interested in Bitcoin securing their custody workflows and starting thinking about um, their, their security in general. Moved on to the more institutional side of custody in 2017 uh, with a company called DACC, which was later acquired by BACT. Um, and previously I was doing research for institutions at Digital Asset Research. Um, and uh, I'm now transitioned, I've, I've transitioned to Coinmetrics and I'm working on uh, network data at Coinmetrics as of right now. Hi everyone, uh, Ada Kokoshi. I have worked, I work currently for State Street in, as a digital assets lead and I primarily focus my work on building business models to service the needs of our clients for who are interested in um, getting into digital assets and I can explain a little bit of that later as we speak. I started my career at State Street. I also started in custody. So um, State Street is a small startup in Boston <laughs> with only $33 trillion of assets in custody. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Yes, I should have started with that. Yeah, so State Street is a company that provides custody services, trading um, and lending, as well as data analytics capabilities to institutional investors. Uh, and by institutional investors, in this case, I mean money managers, asset owners, um, asset managers insurance companies whose assets uh, are above 50 billion and plus. Um, and when I, I've started, I've worked at Station for over 12 years and I've had the pleasure to work around different businesses um, in the company, including the back office, middle office, and front office. And now I am working on the digital asset space. Awesome, and Ria? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, hello from virtual <laughs> webcam world. <laughs> um, so my background is in sell-side equity research. Um, before entering crypto, I uh, worked at Credit Suisse where I covered fintech and payments companies like Square and PayPal. Um, when Square rolled out Bitcoin buying and selling by Cash App, my team and I wrote a report on Bitcoin and blockchain that piqued significant interest um, from our clients. And through this work and some of the events that we held, um, I realized that this was a space that I was really excited by and interested in. And I realized that there was a significant education and institutional grade research gap that was waiting to be filled. Um, so in order to do that, I joined Circle in early 2018 to build out Circle Research, where I published uh, research for our institutional and retail clients. And then I joined Fidelity Digital Assets, where I'm now the director of research here to build out um, a value-added research service uh, similar to sell-side style research for institutional clients to help them navigate the infrastructure and asset class. Thank you, Ria, for joining us virtually. 
Um, so before we dive in, I want to set the stage, right? When we talk about institutions, it's a wide variety, right? It's not one kind of company. So what are the various types of institutions? You did touch upon that in the introduction, but what are the various types of institutions that we are talking about? And also in the crypto sphere, what, who, which companies would we consider as inst institutions? Uh, <laughs> Anyone can do it. <laughs> um, the different types of institutions, so if you think about the, the value chain of finance in general, right, there, there's a lot of different institutions that focus on different markets. Uh, my, for State Street, the institutions that we service, uh, as I mentioned, we service large pension funds, large money managers that think, uh, look at 401k plans um, and other similar, or mutual funds, similar products. Um, and they play a lot in public markets or derivatives, um, and they play a little bit in private placements and um, private securities. So in the context of how are they thinking about digital assets for them, it takes a different notion than how they're thinking about, or how another company like a smaller size company would think about digital assets, and I'd, you know, I'd love to hear Ria and Luca's um, perspective on that. Yeah, I would say that um, there's a, 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 a wide spectrum of institutions that are looking into um, digital assets from, you know, custodians that are now having to deal with that mm -hmm. as a problem, I guess, um, the, the, the trust model and, and what the asset represents uh, is changed consider considerably with digital assets. Um, but it's, it's um, when you're thinking about the... Um, crypto-related institutions that were native. Um, I would consider, you know, Coinbase, for example, um, because they're trying to emulate existing structures in, in, in finance as kind of a crypto institution. Um, but I would say that the majority of um, institutionalization that's happening in, in crypto as of right now is um, probably coming from the incumbents that have grown up um, relative to, you know, new en entries from, from existing um, uh, institutions. I think there's a lot of people who, um, and we can talk about this a little bit more, but um, a lot of institutions got around in 2014 or so um, and started looking at this space as um, you know, a new backend for their operations. And there was this idea that blockchains provided this miraculous uh, database structure that would solve everyone's problems. And um, a lot of their initiatives started with, um, you know, thinking of blockchains. Like, how can we add a blockchain to this, you know, system where we're tracking uh, supply chains or, um, you know, fish from Japan? Some some very interesting use cases. And then, as the use cases proved unrealistic uh, and to an extent didn't really yield um, a lot of usage. There's a new type of institution that um, is now interested in this and looking at it from the digital assets perspective and not so much on, from the blockchain perspective, um, which has been an interesting shift. So now you see more of the um, uh, entities like State Street versus, you know, um, um, in the past you had even supermarkets that were looking at, um, at blockchains. So it's changed considerably over the past years or so. Ria, do you want to add? Yeah, sure. So the way that I think about um, institutions is kind of in two or three different buckets. So you have the institutional infrastructure providers like custodians, uh, derivatives platforms, exchanges, um, lending companies, data companies. And these, as both Ara and Lucas mentioned, can be divided into crypto native and then more incumbent legacy institutions. And then you have um, the investors, so institutional investors, which can be divided into crypto native hedge funds and venture capital funds. And, and there's, I think there's overlap. Um, there can be like funds that are a hybrid of both. And then you have more incumbent legacy institutions like pension funds, uh, RIAs, endowments, foundations, uh, global macro hedge funds and whatnot. Um, so, you know, obviously when the, the first institutions to get involved in this space were crypto native and more and more we're seeing more legacy incumbent institutions um, 
in terms of both providers and investors getting involved in the space. Yeah, so this is a question for Ria and Ada, but Lucas, feel free to chime in. So you both are working in one of these largest institutions. So as an insider, what is some change in sentiment that you've seen over the last couple of years towards these digital assets or specifically Bitcoin? Um, yeah, would love to hear more. Shall we start with Ria? <laughs> sure, I can kick it off. Um, so I think in 2018, the, the landscape of providers and investors was, and, and prior to that was primarily like crypto native and crypto startups. Um, and then we saw incumbent service providers start making more announcements about launching businesses, um, supporting the space, and they began to roll out these offerings in 2019. Um, and then simultaneously, I think this is when legacy financial institutions or legacy investors really started looking at the space more seriously. Um, and as we know, I think around this time last year, some endowments like Harvard, um, Yale, MIT made allocations to the space um, indirectly via crypto funds. So uh, I think today institutional investors are recognizing that this asset class is something that they really can't ignore. Um, there has been significant capital and regulatory clarity um, in the space over the past couple of years. And I think that they've become more sophisticated and knowledgeable about the space. And they've expanded their strategy to think about, like beyond making indirect investments, to think about, you know, how do we want to make an allocation to the space? Do we want it to be directly um, into Bitcoin? Or do we want it to be into a passive fund that holds Bitcoin or a basket of assets? Or do we want it to be um, into a fund manager that has a more active strategy um, and, and whatnot. So that's how I think it's in, evolved over the past couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So one of the things that we noticed is that when clients, a few years ago, clients would be very wary of the term crypto and Bitcoin and sometimes use them or use anything that was blockchain um, related uh, and related to Bitcoin, and there was uh, a little bit of a uh, fear, right, a misconception. But as the market has evolved, there has been a lot of a more more interest in a positive direction, where now they're looking into Bitcoin and other cryptos as a way of diversifying their portfolios, basically getting into uh, um, allocating some of their assets into that space. And as we have mentioned, they could do that either through fund allocation or direct investment, and. Um, one of the challenges that they're facing because of the large size that they represent and the large amount of money that they hold on behalf of clients is regulatory concerns. So they're working closely with the regulators to understand what those challenges are and how might they be able to um, consider um, tackling those challenges head on from an institutional point of view. The so th there's crypto as an asset class. Then there's the idea of how do you emulate the efficiencies that cryptos bring into regular securities and into the re regular investments. And the, the whole concept of tokenization of securities has taken off in institutional investments. Um, from my point of view, from the type of work that I do, figuring out how to service these securities that are um, currently, you know, they are currently in the markets but can be represented in token form. It's um, an exciting part of my job, but it's also challenging because now we're talking about building a legacy, um, or rather marrying a legacy system into an ecosystem that promises a lot of efficiencies, but understanding what those efficiencies can be taken from day one versus what happens in the future, that's um, a step-by-step -step approach that we're taking to that. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like there's a few areas where um, institutions are playing are paying close attention to. I think, you know, in terms of digital assets, it's very clear that is 90% Bitcoin centric. Um, very little interest for other protocols. Even though they've they've reached a level of maturity, um, I think the community has done a great job showcasing um, politically what Bitcoin represents, like how difficult it is to change some of its, you know, core rules or its constitution. How I like to say it. Um, and so there's a lot of focus on Bitcoin and, and you know, 
in terms of, of the software to support secure custody, uh, that has gone through you know a, a, a major overhaul over the past six seven years, um, and now there's some pretty solid workflows that you can you can work out of that gives institutions some comfort. Um, but then there's security tokens, which is another. Interestingly enough, it's it's a it's a high point of, of interest for mm -hmm. for institutions. Um, even though when you talk about security tokens with crypto native folk, it's like, is that a thing? <laughs> is that even even happening? Um, I think it's it's important because it. Um, although we haven't really seen much in practice uh, last year, you know, Santander and SG issue multi million dollar bonds on Ethereum as kind of, you know, a, a flex uh, on their solidity skills, I guess. But they were the, the, the counterparts of those loans, and you're literally just looking at the, the public blockchain as this uh, back end where um, things become a little bit more auditable. Uh, there are some initiatives on Bitcoin. Uh, Blockstream is pushing issue assets, for example, as a use case for liquid. I think that can be, that can be interesting um, because it introduces this idea of privacy into it um, and, and auditability. Um, but it is one of those disconnects where on the institutional side, there's a tremendous amount of interest in security tokens, whereas on, on the crypto side, um, that is mostly focused on, on, on Ethereum and, and somewhat limited um, and looking from it from a maybe a, a different perspective. Um, yeah, that's an interesting And that's point. where, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, I think that's where we'll see like, traditional incumbents and incumbent providers really working together with um, the crypto native companies that have deep knowledge of how this technology works to kind of bridge that gap and, and bridge that demand. Yeah, that's pretty interesting you brought it up. So I used to work at Santander before moving to the space. So last year, they uh, did a bond offering of $20 million on Ethereum. Uh, but even uh, we saw Bank of China come out in December last year, they did around $2.8 billion of bond offering um, for small and medium-sized businesses to give easy access to capital. So that's an interesting trend we have seen. Uh, World Bank come in, IMF come in, you know, experimenting with bond issuances on, on blockchain. But, uh, regarding specifically regarding security token and tokenization of assets, I did some research with the DCI last year, and we were, you know, diving into real estate as a specific use case um, because there was a lot of interest in it. A lot of new companies came out and started tokenizing real estate, but we did not see a lot of value add in our research. And there were so many issues that needs to be addressed in terms of liquidity. Is there demand for a random real estate asset? to be tokenized, are people actually gonna buy 101 Sesame Street? Um, you know, questions around that, questions around governance. So there's a lot still left to be experimented. I'm curious to hear what you guys think as uh, the low hanging fruit in security tokenization. I think in terms of tooling, uh, it is somewhat trivial to implement some of these assets. I think for um, real estate, I think that was kind of one of the first promised use cases where you could just um, better keep track of um, uh, rates, for example, or you know, enabling more people to access a specific uh, product. I think there's a lot on the regulatory side that um, has not been fully addressed. But you know, we've seen some interesting experiments. I think um, last year, the, the London Stock Exchange had a regulatory sandbox um, for companies that wanted to go pretty crazy with crypto and just do things that are analogous to um, uh, real world you know, functions within finance. So there's this company called 2030 that um, wanted to go public and they quoted going public with Mor Morgan Stanley and the cost of doing that was insanely high and the value add was very little. And they used this regulatory sandbox to basically just issue shares of their own companies. And it was something that cost, I think, 0.01% of the cost of going with Morgan Stanley. Um, it is very tempting for the incumbents to, to look at that as you know, the value add, given that few companies are decided to go public in, in recent history. So 
that's one of the more beneficial use cases, I think. You're selling a security, you're raising funds. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that this is a stock. You're not trying to you know, uh, put some utility <laughs> in it. Um, but yeah. you know, it, it was great that the FCA gave companies like that that regulatory sandbox. Um, I wish that was happening a little bit more here in the US. Um, yeah. I think uh, when you're thinking about security tokens, if you think about what the benefit or why our company is doing that, it goes back to the reason that uh, investors or the participants are hungry for transparency in this space, right? If you think about how, the token, how an asset gets issued and then the different hands and the paperwork that goes alongside with the issuance of an asset, right? Like in a simple form, if you think about like getting a loan for to buy a house, right? The different participants that come in and how those discussions or those conversations take place and you as the uh, last recipient of that don't really know what's happening in the back, off, in the back right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the world of blockchain promises to change that, right? Or at least that sort of uh, understanding that more transparency will come in with a distributed ledger. Um, and on top of that, then you're adding the capability of smart contracts. Uh, so self-executing code uh, for the obligations that the asset holds or um, confining the asset to uphold its regulatory obligations. Those types of promises are very enticing to issuers that are looking to go into uh, security tokens. And then, uh, so it's, you know, looking at it from a database perspective and information tracking and transparency, it's very enticing. Um, and it also then promises low cost and whatnot, right? But uh, I have a feeling, I, I, and it's just my personal opinion, I have a feeling that if the market is to advance, we're gonna have to work in a parallel world before we uh, embrace the world of distributed ledger-based databases um, towards the future. The, the issue of liquidity then yeah. becomes an issue of is the asset good for the investor and is the asset, and I, I think that's to be seen, right, where whether or not individual investors like myself would wanna buy uh, a piece of real estate or a piece of art in the future. Um, I don't know, yeah. like I don't know the, the market participation in that, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I would echo um, Ara and Lucas, and what I'd add, or what I think is the impetus, or has been the impetus to uh, explore uh, security tokens and just tokenization of assets is, pro and something that has, there have been a lot of proof of concepts um, on is bridging the detachment between trading and settlement. Um, so, you know, right now you trade, but then actual settlement happens, like, two to three days after. Um, so I think the low hanging fruit has been to kind of bridge that gap. A couple weeks ago, we heard about Paxos rolling out um, a pilot for, uh, you know, speeding up the, the settlement of equities trades using blockchain technology. Um, so I, I think you know, I, I would echo Lucas's comments that mo most of these have just been pilots so far, um, and it'll be interesting to see how these use cases prove out over time. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I would add that, you know, there, there are some benefits that um, I think we should also consider for, you know, Bitcoin as a network to kind of embrace some, some of these more edgy um, use cases. I think, you know, we've, we've gone through uh, colored coins uh, pretty quickly, and there's a lot of junk on the blockchain as a result of, as a result of that. Um, but as these discussions about you know is Bitcoin's uh, uh, security sustainable over the long run uh, start gaining some more interest, I think is is interesting to think about you know the settlement of securities on the Bitcoin blockchain um, as a driver of fees because it is still much cheaper, orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, a centralized system. But at the same time, you're driving you know, fees on a network um, that could be beneficial in the long run. Um, it's interesting, conceptually, I have mixed feelings about it just because uh, it becomes a question of when does it become- Is that the valid? Sorry, was that Ria? 
No, I was just saying, is that the valid use of block space? There's like this exactly, debate. Exactly, yeah. When, when does it become junk? Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. For trades, like if you're, if you're pricing, for example, a, a complex derivative, it, there's value in having that data there, fully accessible and audible. Um, but because I think there's, there's some philosophical questions on those trade-offs of doing that on the public blockchain, um, and you know, lack of interest, I think, from crypto native folk in building the tooling required for you to do that more freely. Um, I think that's one of those disconnects between you know the institution, the institutions that are very interested in, in now digital assets on public blockchains, and you know, crypto native people who um, have had some very you know um, strong opinions on yeah. these institutions. Mm -hmm. um, some other topics, though, I think, kind of bridge interests and you know merge um, values. I think one of them is uh, guaranteeing that exchanges who are the custodians for the majority of, if you consider a Bitcoin user as someone who holds Bitcoin, maybe through a third party, um, those exchanges after 2017 or you know throughout Bitcoin's history um, have misbehaved considerably. And I think that's something that concerns um, Bitcoiners and you know, institutions alike. Um, I went through the effort of trying to find what was the reported volume of Bitcoin uh, over the course of 2019 last year. And when you, when you do that, it's, it's very interesting. You see some very interesting activity. Um, one exchange reported one trade that was executed, um, and the size of that trade was 13 million bitcoins. Wow. How is that possible? <laughs> it is not. It is clearly <laughs> being manipulated. Um, and without controls around those exchanges that at times are reporting really crazy activity, yep. um, it is difficult for us to retain bitcoins, um, you know, uh, core properties. Right. Um, it's difficult to not to say that these exchanges are not engaging in fractional reserve banking and uh, inflating Bitcoin's monetary base. So I think that's one of the topics that uh, everyone can align. And I think we're seeing some interest from crypto native people yeah. uh, on that as well. Yeah, no, definitely. That brings up a good point of the challenges that institutions are facing. Right, so there, you know, so far we've seen there's interest. They are interested. They're curious. They're doing some efforts. They're experimenting. But still, in terms of infrastructure, um, we are not ready for the next wave of, you know, institution adoption. So, you know, can you talk a little bit more about what are the different challenges that you're seeing, and then uh, also we can talk about what the industry as a whole can do to gain this trust of institutions coming in the space. Um, the challenges. <laughs> Every day is a challenge, right? Um, I think uh, there's a number. That it, it depends on how you see it, right? Um, I think there's, I see it as there's a lot of work to be done uh, rather than a ton of challenges. And partly it's because, so there's, one is market adoption, right? Uh, this space is um, fairly new for uh, the folks that are not embedded into crypto specific activities, right? So if you, if you remove yourself out of that and just think about the financial services in general, there are a ton of other, um, there's a ton of other uh, events that are happening in finance, right? I mean, some, the stock market like this last week yeah. it just didn't behave well. So um, in general, when you're thinking about 401k plans or ETFs and mutual funds, there's a ton of competition between the providers which are driving the fees down. So when you're thinking about these institutions, they're thinking of new ways to create value for their customers, right? Um, and cryptos might be one way to do that. Um, but in, in terms of sort of prioritizing decision-making of what takes precedence, typically for big financial companies, um, it, it's taking care of the customer and having that fiduciary responsibility for the customer is, is the number one priority. And whatever shape that takes, that's sort of like what you need to address first. 
Uh, but that's not, you know, there is a desire to be able to be ready for the future, to be able to understand what are some of the things that could be done in this new space, and how do we unlock the promises that um, emerging technologies provide. So these are, explore, um, excuse me, th these are opportunities where now providers, service providers can take that extra step to provide better services for the end customer and, ha and uphold to that fiduciary responsibility. But it takes work because um, you're talking about redesigning the entire value chain, right? So when you're thinking about liquidity, fine, you and I can go into an exchange and you and I can uh, transact, right? But what happens behind that transaction, there's a ton of work that we as end customers don't see that uh, that there, <laughs> um, creates a lot of opportunity to a to provide transparency, but also to understand how those pieces move. Yeah, and that you know dives into custody a little bit, and mm -hmm. I want to talk more about it. But before that, I know Lucas, you are really passionate about proof of reserves, and yeah. I would love to hear more about that. Sure. Um, so there's some, I think, underappreciated benefits um, with proof of reserves that you know are, 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 are maybe not obvious at first. You think about it from um, from the perspective where you you want to make sure that bitcoins that are in these third parties and there are being uh, um, you know used for trading are fully collateralized. That's good. Um, that means the, 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 the monetary base is not being inflated. Um, it is unfortunate, but the majority of people, the majority of newcomers are gonna continue to use third parties to custody their funds. Um, there is a lot of educational resources as of right now for them not to, but it is too tempting not to. And I think in terms of education, it is a lot to incur and a lot of mistakes that, could, that you could make, and I think we're gonna continue to see third parties hold a considerable amount of Bitcoin. And Yeah, and additionally, regulation-wise, institutions are, um, you know, by regulation, supposed to hold, if they have assets more than $150,000 of their yeah. customers, they're supposed to hold with a custodian, with a qualified custodian. So exactly. there's that aspect as well. Yeah, there, there, there's an aspect that um, you have these uh, regulatory requirements that come from you know, traditional finance where if you're a custodian, you have to um, follow your you know, fiduciary duty and provide reporting on your clients and things of that nature. So as it, crypto gets a little bit more institutionalized, I think we're still gonna see third parties hold a considerable um, amount of Bitcoin, it's just difficult to see a future where, you know, that's not a threat to the system in terms of just not having any checks and balances for these third parties. And I think proof of reserves is one of those checks and balances. Uh, it, it, it guarantees that at least you're collateralized and we don't have anything in place as of right now to guarantee that. And at the same time, we see that a lot of exchanges are abusing um, you know, the market, they're manipulating data. So it doesn't take you know, much imagination to just think about whether or not they're being, you know, uh, they're engaging fractional reserve banking. Yeah. There's evidence that a lot of them have in the past. So how Finney had this idea, I think in 2012 of Bitcoin banks where mm -hmm. It, it, it was, it was uh, pitched as one of the easiest ways to scale Bitcoin is to um, have a third party hold basically a banknote um, that is a cash-like system and you can transact based on that balance that exists and that's locked. I think proof of reserves might be you know, one of the first steps to enabling that to happen because you can verify uh, the custody and uh, you know the, the reserves of specific financial products uh, and not have to actually transact on chain. If you're relying on you know a third party to custody your funds, at least you can see that this bank note is backed by this UTXO on chain. 
So there are a lot of you know, potential benefits that go beyond just transparency for a system like proof, proof of reserves. Um, and you know, it's, it's that topic that I think now, because institutions are looking more closely at the space and looking more closely at the, the abuse that has happened uh, starting in, I think, in, in 2017, um, uh, where you, you had an explosion yeah. of, of exchanges. Um, these two are kind of converging. Um, so it, it's one of the things that I think it's worth embracing because um, it has the immediate benefit of um, uh, preventing these large third parties from engaging fractional reserve banking. But long term, you can think about some novel technologies that are built on top of a system of proof of reserves. Yeah, yeah I'd I like would to love to hear just, your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I think that what may happen, and okay, so what has happened right now is there are, depending on how comfortable you are holding your own assets, your level of technical knowledge, your level of understanding of the ecosystem, there are options that you have. So if you, if you want to self custody, there are options available to you. There are hardware wallets, there are services like Casa, um, which kind of, I think, falls in between. And then, you know, you may want, you may not want to self custody at all and just feel more comfortable storing your assets um, at an exchange or a custodian. So if you're one of those people and you don't want to self custody, then I think that, or I hope that what develops over time is um, different providers will offer different levels of assurances. So I think people may be willing to pay a premium to use a provider that conducts proof of solvency where they prove that, you know, the amount that they, the total amount in client bal balances matches um, the amount of assets that they hold on chain. There may be service providers that explicitly say like, hey, we are going to uh, like lend out or rehypothecate a portion of the assets, but we'll show you like how much we actually have and maintain that reserve ratio uh, on a transparent basis. And for that, we'll give you a yield. Um, and then there may be providers that never uh, publish proof of reserves or proof of solvency and uh, you know, they might provide a cheaper option or the market might move away from using those service providers at all. Um, so I think that may be one way that, that this proof of reserves uh, implementation develops over time. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's, there's some privacy considerations as well for these providers where um, they don't wanna dox themselves. Uh, I think the reality as of right now, if you look at things like address reuse and um, you know, tagging of, of specific entities on a blockchain, to a big extent, these, these entities are known um, and have already been doxxed. So the privacy considerations, I think, um, even if we, we start with another third party who's providing attestations for solvency, uh, as, 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 as Ria was, was saying, I think that as an initial step could be you know, uh, a very reasonable compromise for these institutions that might be concerned about privacy but uh, at the same time, they recognize the need for um, something like proof, proof of reserves. So I think, you know, like Ria said, the moment a provider um, starts offering this as an added benefit, and I think mm -hmm. there are a couple right now that um, um, are, are, are starting to do that. CoinFloor in the, in the UK is doing it. Uh, I think River Financial is also um, thinking about this um, closely. So. I think it, it will be a huge selling point to the average user who actually gets what is you know the one of the the, the benefits of this technology uh, in terms of monetary policy, uh, and providers that do offer that should expect it to be you know great marketing. Uh, they're yeah. doing something that's positive to the system, so. Um, uh, if you're an exchange, please consider this. <laughs> <laughs> and to the point about privacy, I think there have been some, I don't think it's been rolled out at, or even implemented at scale uh, 
or by even any single provider yet, but there have been papers published about using zero knowledge proofs to uh, protect confidential information about individual client accounts, as well as what the total assets held by an exchange or custodian. Yeah, I do want to leave time for questions. So if you have questions, please do line up. Uh, in the meanwhile, I was asked to bring up Bitcoin ETFs. <laughs> um, I, you know, my personal opinion is it, it is inevitable. It will happen, but it takes time uh, for the regulators to get comfortable with the concept of a Bitcoin ETF. Um, you know, we've seen semi-transparent or non-transparent ETFs. State Street has, had a survey on it uh, come out after 11 years, and that's you know a traditional uh, product, financial product. Um, but with Bitcoin ETFs, you know, I. Based on Fidelity survey and Straight Street survey, it seems like that's where institutions are interested in getting involved with, uh, instead of direct custody, direct holding these assets. So, any thoughts on on that? Yeah. So, I think I, I see it as a positive sign that institutions do want to offer cryptos as a product to the end customer, and they're trying to find ways to do so securely, right? So, they uh, by putting it in ETF form and uh, listing it in public exchanges where, and then holding the underlying security somewhere safe, or perhaps in cold storage so that liquidity is not really affected that much, or rather the movement of the asset is not affected. That's the, so that's sort of like the first path to, to making it a reality. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the regulators, there's a prediction that the, the regulators will accept it by 2020. So it'll be this interesting, year. yeah, this yeah, year. this year. <laughs> and we're three months in, right, so. Um, yeah, I'm excited for it personally to see how that happens. Cool, yeah, we can take questions. Yes. Um, sure, thanks. Hi. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see institutions getting into digital assets, and you guys sort of talked about a lot of different risks, like exchanges being collateralized. But it seems like institutions are kind of taking protocol level security for granted. Like, oh, Bitcoin's been around for 10 years, nothing's gone wrong so far, it's a safe asset for me to hold. And I don't, I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, you know, from all three of you, how are institutions thinking about this? I mean, there's like many vulnerabilities on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. There was an inflation bug present in Bitcoin for 18 months. Um, as far as I can tell, no one's paying attention to what the mining pools are really doing and, you know, um, there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lack of, I don't know if this is a tragedy of the commons kind of thing, but people are not paying attention. And I haven't seen institutions really acknowledging this risk. And so I'm curious, do you, do you guys see it or what is the path to get more recognition for this? I think, you know, I think a lot, I think we, we tend to underestimate um, institutions sometimes because we think of them as um, newcomers. Some institutions have very good engineers who um, pay close attention to this and I think they are aware of some of the risks associated with uh, digital assets. I think if you think about it, uh, you know, when, when they first started signaling some interest in, in, in crypto back in 2015, um, what version of Bitcoin Core was that? Uh, I don't remember, but it's changed so much and it's matured to a point where um, that provides a level of comfort, comfort to them. Uh, I think there's still awareness that, um, you know, the network is still small in terms of, of its maintainers. I think there's awareness that in, in, in Bitcoin's history there, there have been uh, considerable exploits. I think there's more of a focus on um, exploits that have occurred for third, because of, you know, third-party negligence uh, rather than protocol level exploits. Um, I think we are in a relatively stable version of, 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 of Bitcoin and I'm, I'm cognizant of, of, of some of these risks. I just don't think if you look at digital assets in, in, in their full spectrum and you compare you know, uh, Bitcoin with an emerging protocol, it's as if they're two completely different um, uh, pieces of, they are two different pieces of software, but the assurances around them are also completely different. So I think there's a little bit more comfort with Bitcoin and hence focus initially on Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I would say that this 
is definitely something that institutional infrastructure providers are tracking. Um, you know, at Fidelity, we have our Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. Um, I think you know, we've been looking at this space since 2013. We've built deep crypto knowledge and expertise, and we have a lot of really smart people that understand uh, uh, Bitcoin and other protocols from a technical point of view. And this is absolutely something that they're monitoring, um, that we're monitoring. And I think that if there was ever an issue that we needed to communicate, that's obviously something that we would do our part to communicate and educate um, and clients about. But from the institutional investor point of view, like I, I agree, like I'm not sure that this is something that they are even aware of. Um, so it's definitely on us as an industry to be very transparent um, and vocal about all of the risks involved with investing in digital assets. Um, so you'll kind of mention that um that it, it seems like a lot of people are having a, a hard time with uh, holding on to private keys with Bitcoin, or the assumption is that uh, institutions will want to go to a, a custody provider. Um, at Unchained, we kind of we use some of uh, actually Coinmetrics metrics to try to estimate the number of Bitcoin held by private key today, and we found that with an estimate of like four and a half or four bit four million Bitcoin missing and maybe eight to 10 million Bitcoin on exchanges, that that still leaves about 10 million Bitcoin out there um, with private key ownership. So I don't know, this is kind of a question for Lucas, but do you think that we're gonna be moving further in the direction of private key ownership or further in the direction of, of third party? I, I hope um, we continue to educate the risks of, um, centralized third parties for the average user who might be creating uh, an account on a shady exchange because reasons. Um, but I think for some regulatory reasons and because there is this um, existing you know, model for funds that want to invest in assets, um, that third party custody is kind of unavoidable. And I think it's part of your learning cycle to withdraw that Bitcoin from that exchange and you know store it in, in, in a way that's that's safe. Um, I think as we are incurring, incurring additional users, um, the numbers, right? It's just something that it's unavoidable. I think. Um, I, I guess I was asking, like speaking in in Bitcoin terms, mm -hmm. right? Like not in maybe U.S. dollars that are coming in, but mm -hmm. do you have you seen any indication that the number of Bitcoin are centralizing in exchanges or are we kind of moving in the direction of away from centralized third parties towards private key ownership? I think there's more private key ownership. Uh, I'm not sure in terms of, of uh, I haven't looked into this uh, recently, but in terms of like a Gini coefficient, for example, for ownership, um, something that we might explore uh, soon, but uh, it, it's definitely, you know, I think as additional providers of hardware wallets and more education around private key ownership uh, comes out and more exchanges frankly fail and people lose funds, I think the, the, um, the trend uh, hopefully is to private key ownership. So. Hi, so it seems like when it comes to institutional adoption, there's like this catch 22 where um, from the regulator's perspective, it's like uh, we like to point to existing use cases in order to take lessons learned to develop our own regulatory framework. Um, but you know, from the private sector perspective, you can't actually do any of these use cases unless there is a clear regulatory framework. Um, so from y'all's perspective, uh, research, do you know what jurisdictions out there in the world are sort of taking the pioneer approach? And if so, should we? Do you think regulators will put any weight towards these pioneers? I think the FCA has been, uh, in, in, in England, has been very uh, open to innovation and they've done these regulatory sandboxes where um, people have tried very various use cases for it. Um, I, you know, getting more familiar with the SEC's current structure as of right now makes me a little bit more 
comfortable. I think you know they are they have a, 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 a fin hub that's looking into crypto closely um, with dozens of people, and they're also very well funded. So they're um, looking at it from an enforcement perspective and letting some of those enforcement actions educate them in the discovery period. So I think it is evolving positively in, in the United States. There's just this um, regulatory, um, I guess, uh, when is it your jurisdiction, basically? Like when does the treasury has, have to step in and issue you know, certain uh, comments or you know, what divides them between CFTC now with uh, looking into all of these Bitcoin-based derivatives that are, that are trading and Bitcoin kind of solidifying itself as a commodity uh, versus something like that's more a security, more like a, a equity or, or a bond. I think that's a question of what does the asset represent? And I think that's probably being answered as of right now, which is gonna be very beneficial. Um, basically a taxonomy for digital assets framework to determine when something's a security, when something's a commodity, and there might be some in-betweens that get ugly, but it seems like we're, we're moving the, in the right direction on that. Cool. And um, I think Hester, oh, just quickly. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Hester Peirce actually uh, published a sandbox proposal similar to, I think, the one that the FCA has adopted, and right now she's collecting comments on it to um, allow different crypto projects that are farther along in their life cycle to um, experiment and just collect information and research in in a regulatorily compliant way. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops this year as well. Okay, I've been prompted to stop talking and <laughs> conclude this panel for lunch. Oh, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we'll give like 10 more minutes. Awesome. Okay with yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, we can continue. Hi. My name Hi. is Will. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you'd run into um, SOC 2 type 2 reporting or ISAE reporting uh, as like means of getting more comfort. So I, I work for an auditing company, and we hate when money goes into exchanges that are not certified because we're like, is it really there? And we're also in the liquidators of the exchanges that ran out of money and then have to find it. So do you see any kind of momentum towards that other than like a couple exchanges here and there or a couple of even just custodians? I think it's becoming industry standard to undergo SOC 1 and SOC 2 type 1, type 2 reporting. We're seeing more and more uh, regulated exchanges and custodians come out with these types of reports. Um, I think it's definitely a great way to provide assurances around security and financial reporting uh, while we hopefully get to a point where we can provide proofs of solvency. So uh, just a level set for the audience, these kind of reports uh, use independent audit firms to uh, test internal controls at service providers like exchanges and custodians to determine whether the controls are um, safe, accurate, um, and conducted in a timely way. So I, I definitely think it's it's going to become industry standard for institutional players to offer these kind of reports to their end users. One of the things that we're noticing is that uh, tokenization platforms or technology vendors that are tokenization platforms, they're undergoing these types of tests themselves just so that they can make regulators and other market participants comfortable with their offering. Cool. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. My question is about security tokens, um, which is something that's starting to grow with some of the leading compliance solutions like Securitize or TokenSoft. And I'm curious, um, from an institutional perspective, why a fund would want to invest in these right now and hold them in their portfolios because of like liquidity risk or the compliance cost with these. I understand that like doing it on a public blockchain and not having it traded or permission is different from having it tokenized on like Ethereum or Algorand and being able to participate in it, have everyone participate in a permissionless or semi-permissionless system. 
So I'm kind of curious how far you think we are away from that, where funds willing to hold the tokenized security in uh, their portfolio. Um, how far? So it's work in progress. I think it's a it's a matter of uh, <laughs> it's a matter of seeing how efficient the tokenization of a security actually is, uh, and then understanding whether there's a market for that security to be bought. Right. So if you're um, if the promise of uh, an issue is that. I'm gonna sell my security in the digital assets marketplace, right? Now I'm reaching a new distribution level. That's something that's very enticing to these types of institutions because now they have access to an, a, a completely different market, right? Or it makes it easier for the end consumer to, to, to take that uh, security in. Um, there's, now there's a ton of questioning questions behind that to understand, all right, so if you are trading a security token, what does that mean for trade settlement cycles and what does that mean for the fund itself? What does it mean for, from like a, a CSD, a central security depository, because by regulation you have to have securities registered in a central security depository. So what does that mean for that ecosystem? Um, and like I said, it's work in progress. Like we have to vet all the opportunities that are, that present themselves in the existence regulation and then what could be in the future. But I think the number one, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the number one promise is the promise of transparency, uh, efficiency, and low cost, co excuse me, low cost. And the second is new distribution levels. Yeah, I think, you know, from, from a, the fund's perspective, if this is a novel product that is unique and enables them to invest in something that they couldn't in, in you know traditional finance. I think th the interest would be there. Um, if it's a structured product, for example, where y the um, the holder can audit you know balances that constitute the structured product, I think you know that's that's a novel um, uh, incentive for these funds to look at it more closely. I think. As of right now, I think the incentives are from um, that settlement perspective, and because funds don't have to incur that cost, and because fees are probably going to continue to be the same, um, I don't think they care that much, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think I think the interest is from the clearinghouses, the exchanges, uh, not necessarily, you know. Um, funds that might want to um, invest in security tokens directly, as long as we're not talking about like a very novel product that we haven't seen just yet. Um. Thank you. Hey there. Uh, I had a question regarding just kind of curiosity from the institutional perspective regarding in the next five years, where do you envision the biggest areas of growth as crypto as an asset class? Ria, you want to start? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. I mean, I think initially for the more traditional institutional players, it's just getting comfortable around even making an allocation to Bitcoin, which has the most infrastructure built around it. Um, it has an analog in gold. Um, but, but still, like, developing a thesis around that is going to, take some time and it's going to, you know, it, it's not going to happen all at once. It's going to happen in stages. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, like they started off by making indirect investments. So next, is it like, oh, are we, do we want to make direct investments into Bitcoin and maybe the next um, top 10 assets that have sufficient liquidity and infrastructure around it? And then after that you know, we as an industry have to figure out what kind of traditional assets um, should be tokenized. Uh, so I think that's a longer term area of interest from institutional investors as well. Thank you everyone. Thank you to the panelists for speaking today.